Thanks, Chuck. I always enjoy hearing Chuck play. We, uh, wife and I visited a church in Oklahoma, and they were doing uh, I'll Fly Away, and they got lady and little husband playing the guitar there, and Dina leaves over and says, that's not the way Chuck plays it. So, <laughs> there's, there's nothing like, there's nothing like home. Nothing like home. Huh? <laughs> Let's open in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the, for the music, Lord, the time to worship you and lift up your voice in song, Lord. Lord, we thank you for everyone that's here. Lord, be with those that can't be here with us today. Lord, and just, uh, Put a special blessing and touch on their lives for whatever issues they have going on, Lord. We ask this in your son's precious holy name. Amen. 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 Today's sermon is a song. Who likes Matthew West? Come on, who's a fan of Matthew West? All right. All right. Then y'all should know the words. Okay. Well, if you start singing, you do. It's the hardest thing to give away, the last thing on your mind today. It always goes to those that don't deserve. It's the opposite of how you feel when the pain they caused is real. And it takes everything you have to say the word, forgiveness. Yes, the title of today's sermon is Forgiveness. There are two things that are definite truths when it comes to forgiveness. and We're going to go over both of those today. The first one is probably the harshest one is uh, we must forgive to be forgiven. Jesus says it in several places in the Bible. Uh, if you're taking notes, Matthew 7, 2. For in the same way as you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I know, I read that verse and I cried too, buddy. Mark eleven twenty five. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive him so that your Father in heaven may forgive you your sins. Paul also says in Colossians 3.13, Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you may have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. As the Lord forgave you. These verses tell us that if we don't forgive others for the things they've done to us or against us, that our Father in Heaven can't forgive us. Some people, most of us, who have trouble for forgive with forgiveness, we think that forgiveness doesn't take, it, take the, the offense seriously. But forgiveness does take it seriously. It, it can cause attention to the person that has wronged us. It's not an excuse. And in many ways it holds the uh, offender, the sinner, accountable for their actions. You may find that sometimes a person that offended you, hurt your feelings, may not have even known they did it. Or it might have even been, you know, unforgiven, un or unforgivable. They may not have meant it. You may have taken it the wrong way because you were having a bad day. Um, wives, you know what I'm talking about? Me? What? Oh, I'm sorry. Did, <clears throat> did that come out? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I, I'm just helping you out, Mike, okay? I'm just trying to help you out here. <laughs> Unforgiveness actually keeps you trapped in a jail cell of bitterness doing time for someone else's crime. It's like taking poison and expecting the other person to die. <laughs> Tim Circle. It's clear that it clears the bitterness away. It can even set a prisoner free. There is no end to what its power can do. Let it go and be amazed by what you see through eyes of grace. The prisoner, it really freezes you. You know, I think Matthew West had a hard time writing that song. Um, I know I would have. Uh, this sermon kind of came about because Dina was discussing with someone she knows about unforgiveness. And I got to thinking about it and I thought, well, I'm, a lot of people struggle with that and it's something that's really worth uh, talking about and learning about. Now, you might have heard someone say or you might have even said it yourself, 
I'll forgive them when they tell me they're sorry. Anybody ever heard that? Yeah? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands of who's actually said that, but if you did, you're probably lying. They hate to say that. <laughs> you know, I'll forgive them when they say they're sorry. The problem with that is if we sit around waiting for the confession or the I'm sorry from some people, you might be waiting a really long, long time. Especially if you fall into the problem where they don't even realize they've wronged you. So you're going to go around just holding on to that, being all angry, because they ain't said they were sorry for it. They might not have even known. And you'll never get it. So what's going to happen? You're going to drag that along with you, and it's going to eat away at you and poke at you, and they don't even know it. Matthew 6, 14 and 15 says, For if you forgive others their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your transgressions. There we go. You got to forgive to be forgiven. What makes it difficult to forgive somebody is when we do so, if we go by God's standards, we uh, give up our right to hold it against them. We actually even give up our right to hear them tell us they're sorry. We even give up our right to bring that up in a future at a later date. Especially in an argument with a spouse. That's for, your, that's for you, Mike. That's uh, for me, too. But it's true. You know, it's easy. Oh, oh yeah, I, I forgive them. And then later on, you won't bring it up again later. You didn't really forgive them. What, what, if, what if God forgave us? And then when we got to heaven, he went ahead and brought up all the stuff that uh, he forgave us for? How would that work out? You give up your right to hold it against others. And actually, if we truly forgave someone, we won't ever bring it up again. It'll be as if it never happened. See, that's the way, way God sees us. When Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of our sins, it's as if the sin never happened. We were washed clean. And when you forgive someone, you're doing the same thing. You have no right to bring it up ever. That's why some people have great difficulty in uh, forgiving other people. Because we like to hold on to things sometimes. Another thing is uh, maybe you don't like confrontation. Many people are afraid of confrontation. They don't want to confront the other person about it. Or they're too prideful. Sometimes you can be too prideful to be the one that says, I'm sorry when you did something wrong. You know, Randall tells a story about him and a friend of his. I wish he was here because he, he knows the story better. They were angry at each other for years. Years. And it was pride that got in the way of that. They finally had a chance to meet after many years and said they were sorry. And it cleared a table that had been full for decades. You know, if we let pride get in the way, we just wallow in our unforgiveness. Like in Randall's case. Just, we're going to be miserable, dragging it along for years. Maybe we just don't want to do the hard work of forgiving somebody. Sometimes the serious of the forgiveness has a lot to do with pettiness and holding grudges. Maybe it was something petty and stupid. Anyone ever have a circumstance where they didn't talk to someone for years over something petty and stupid? I have. Petty and stupid. And when you finally sat down together and discussed the whole thing, you both realized how petty and stupid the whole thing was. How many people have had arguments and held grudges against someone and later on couldn't even remember what they were mad about? Okay, I see hands going up. You don't even remember what you're mad about. Well, I can't believe that happened. What? You know, I really don't remember, but it was bad. It happens. 
It happens. Now, reading these passages, you might say to me, but isn't grace free? Aren't you asking us to earn our salvation by forgiving the people that wronged us? Well, the answer to your first question is yes, God's grace is free. The answer to the second question, however, is although that grace is free, it's not cheap. When God's grace comes into our lives, it doesn't leave us as we were. It changes us. It gives us the power to forgive because we've been forgiven. In fact, by giving forgiveness to others, we're proving that we've accepted God's forgiveness for us. Then we're living in it. If we refuse to forgive those who sin against us, we're showing that we have not really accepted God's grace. That we're not taking God's grace seriously. The second truth, and we touched on a little bit already, is forgiveness is hard. It's not easy to give up our right to be hurt, give up our right to be angry, to not get back, to hate the other person for what they've done. I mean, you may have had terrible things done to you by someone you loved and trusted. They hurt you, they broke your heart and your trust. In fact, you may have lost a great deal because of someone else's actions. That person may have even been a family member. Sometimes we tend to hurt those of us that we love the most and those that are closest to us. In Genesis, and we've been doing Genesis at Bible study, it's Wednesday night, come join us, is the story of Joseph, whose brothers planned on killing him. They didn't care for Joseph much. But it turns out they lacked the guts to do it. So instead, they sold him off to some slave traders to get rid of him. The slave traders, in turn, sell him off to the Egyptians. And in the course of time, Joseph went from slavery to prison and then to a place in Pharaoh's court. Talking about moving on up, man, that's a story right there. Coming from nowhere to being Pharaoh's right-hand person. Before it was over with, he was in charge of all of Egypt, second and only Pharaoh. And, as sometimes karma does, famine struck and drove out Joseph's brothers, and they ended up in Egypt, who still had food, who still had water. And guess who they run into? <laughs> Joseph. It's been a number of years since they sold him off into slavery. And uh, he recognizes them right away. But they don't recognize him because they figured out was the last person they'd ever see again. Now, he tests them for a bit to see if they're still kind of evil. But what it turns out is they're really more pathetic than evil. And just before he reveals himself to them, to forgive them, the Bible says he wept so loudly that the whole palace heard it. Now, we're not told why he wept in the story. It's possible that uh, the forgiveness he was about to give was a little hard, a little painful. But he forgave them. By society standards back then, he had every right and the power to just have him killed off right there. But instead, he embraces his brothers. It wasn't easy. It was hard. It's not easy to forgive, but God in his grace gives us the power to do it. We're able to forgive because God is in charge of our lives. In Genesis 15, 20, Joseph says to his brothers, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. You see, if 
they hadn't sold Joseph into slavery and he hadn't climbed into the ranks, then he wouldn't have had the power and the authority to feed them or to help the people. So God took what someone intended for harm and turned it into something good. So we're able to forgive others because God takes the things that were meant to hurt us and turns them around and uses them for something good. Romans 8.28 says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. I love that. It's one of my favorite verses. Jesus lets us know that if we refuse to forgive, then we really haven't grasped our great need for forgiveness or how much God has forgiven us. And in our pride, sometimes we haven't truly repented. And then God can't forgive us. But when we keep our eyes on the cross, we remember the pain and the suffering that Jesus endured for our forgiveness. But it wasn't just for us. It was for forgiveness for all sins, for everyone. So what makes you so good that he can forgive us by dying on the cross, but we can't forgive others? Are we too good for that? Are we, are we too good? Are we better than he is? He willingly died on the cross so we can be forgiven. So is what he is asking all of us to do, is it really that hard? He's not asking us to suffer, get whipped and beaten and die on the cross. I don't think forgiveness is all that hard when you take that into perspective. Author Philip Yancey wrote a book. I bet Edwin probably knows the book. What's so amazing about grace? You read that book? I figured you had. April 2. In the book, he says, At last I understand in the final analysis, forgiveness is an act of faith. By forgiving another, I am trusting that God is a better justice maker than I am. By forgiving, I release my own right to get even and I leave all issues of fairness for God to work out. I leave in God's hands the scales that must balance justice and mercy. Now, I have not read the book. If Edwin has it, I may borrow it. You have it? That's, um, it's very deep. It's very deep. You know, this is going to sound crazy. But forgiveness is kind of like tithing. Okay, we're not prosperity preaching. I thought the basket's over there. See, tithing is an act of faith. That's where sometimes, and, and I've been at this point, where you're saying, I don't know if I can afford to. I can barely pay my bills now. But it's an act of faith. You're saying that I know that God will look after my needs. And I've learned in the process that he will. If we just trust him. And forgiveness is also an act of faith. Because we're saying if there's any punishment that needs to be dealt out. If there's any consequences that have to be paid for. Or any giving of mercy. God can handle that just fine. And he doesn't need any help from me. He created an entire universe in seven days. He doesn't need my help with anything. Paul says in Romans 12, 19 through 21. Do you ever want to write that down? Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave room for the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But he goes on to tell us if your enemies are hungry, feed them. If they are thirsty, give them something to drink. For by doing this, you will reap burning coals on their head. Ain't nothing hurts worse than somebody being nice to you and you know in your heart you were a jerk. 
he goes on in the end it says do not be overcome by evil but overcome evil with good what the verse is really saying is that by showing grace and mercy our acts will show the love of Christ through us it might possibly stir up something in their spirit they might realize wow I was a jerk maybe I was wrong it just might change their heart. <laughs> I want to share with you an example of what I call ultimate forgiveness. It's a true story, but in this day and age, with the arrogance and the pridefulness of humans, it almost doesn't seem possible. There is a student at Stanford University, 26-year-old woman named Amy Beale. She graduated with a B.A. in International Relations. Received a Fulbright scholarship to research women's rights and fight segregation in South Africa. While she was there, she wasn't even there very long. She was pulled from her car and stabbed to death by a mob in a township near Cape Town. It happened two days before she was coming home to be reunited with her fiance to be married. She didn't know that he was planning to ask her to marry him when she got back. He was just a boyfriend. It was a horrible tragedy. Two years later, Amy's parents returned to the township where she was killed, met with some of the killer's families, believe it or not, to console them. Four young men had been sentenced to 18 years for Amy's murder. The Beals came to witness their testimony in front of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, during which the four men expressed remorse and pleaded for amnesty. The Beals actually supported their release. They were able to bury their anger, hurt, hatred, and forgive. Shortly after that trip, Amy's father passed away. Amy's mother returned to South Africa again, this time to forgive one of the four killers, a man named Abiko. He saw himself as a young freedom fighter, growing up poor and segregated in South Africa's townships. He was taught from childhood that whites were the enemy, But she didn't just give up on him. She gave him a job. A job and a future. Amy's mother created an organization for HIV and AIDS awareness in South Africa called the Amy Beale Foundation. Has programs in townships outside of Cape Town. Now he travels the world with Amy's mother to tell their story of forgiveness and reconciliation. Amy's mother said that Nobiko is part of her family now. It flies in the face of all your pride, moves away the mad inside. It's always anger's own worst enemy. Even when the jury and the judge say you got a right to hold a grudge, it's the whisper in your saying set it free. It's forgiveness. So is there anyone here today that feels that someone's done something to them so terrible and so awful that you can't forgive them for it? Anyone? They did something so terrible and awful to you, you just can't forgive them. Was it worse than what Amy's mother went through? She lost a daughter and was able to forgive her killer. So is it really worse than what Amy went through? We have to forgive those who've hurt us. God commands it. Not necessarily because our own forgiveness hinges on it, but also because it's the best thing for us. When we refuse to forgive, the anger and the bitterness grows in us like a cancer eating away at us, 
causes stress, illness. It robs us of the joy we can have in our lives because we're too busy holding on to bitterness. And the only treatment for this horrible cancer is the surgery of forgiveness. When we refuse to forgive, we allow the sin that was committed against us to hurt us twice. Once when we were first sinned against or wronged, and again by keeping us from receiving God's forgiveness. We need to stop the pain and forgive. We need to let it go and forgive others. The last verse, I want to finally set it free. So show me how to see what your mercy sees. Help me now to give what you gave to me, forgiveness. <coughs> Looking at it through God's eyes. Is there someone you need to forgive? Someone you haven't talked to in a long time because of something they did to you? Maybe even a family member? Is there someone you refuse to trust because of it? Is there someone you avoid like the plague that you won't sit beside maybe and <coughs> won't talk to? Someone you're waiting for a confession or an apology from before you offer forgiveness. You must forgive them. You got to let go of the anger and bitterness. Because like the Bible says, if you can't forgive them, your father cannot forgive you. So do the hard thing and forgive them. Your own forgiveness and salvation relies on it. Forgive and let it go. Be free of it. Stop being trapped as a prisoner in your own mind and forgive. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for a message of forgiveness, Lord. Lord, I ask that you just allow it to touch someone's heart, Lord, someone who's holding on to bitterness and anger, Lord. Lord, just give them the strength to forgive and let it go, Lord, to be free. Lord, to have that heavy burden and weight lifted off their shoulders, Lord. Lord, guide them and direct them throughout their ways, Lord, that everything they say or do show you through us, Lord. Lord, I ask that you just give us the opportunity to forgive those that have wronged us, Lord. And just be a better person for it, Lord. We ask that you forgive us of our sins as well. In your son's precious holy name. Amen.